for the kind introduction. Uh, before I start, I would like to thank the organiser for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to come and speak to you on a rather topical subject. Now, this is what I'm going to talk about, sputum, and the actual technique of induced sputum. Now, I could hear somebody at the back saying, oh, disgusting. Now, after my talk, hopefully I'll be able to convince you sputum does give us a lot of information, and important information, and it's rather lovable. Okay, it helps us a lot in terms of asthma management. Sputum does go back a long way. Hippocrates actually recognized uh, sputum as a very important substance and labeled it as a main body substance. The presence of eosinophils was only noted in 1889, but it was not until the early 90s that people actually started using sputum to examine for the presence of airway inflammation. And in fact, the first paper on the technique of induced sputum only came out about 15 years ago. The paper was published in Thorax. Now, what has actually happened subsequent to that is phenomenal. I mean, over the last 10 years, looking at the number of papers published linking sputum induction or sputum and airway inflammation, you can tell it's increasing at a tremendous rate. So in the next 25 minutes, I'm going to divide my talk into three parts. The first part, I'm going to tell you something about the technical issue of sputum induction. How is it done? Is it safe? And then the second part, I'm going to share with you some of my research work using induced sputum and in relation to childhood asthma. Last but not least, I'm going to tell you some problems, some limitations associated with this procedure. Now this slide summarizes quite nicely the actual procedure. So after inhaling a salty water or solution, which is similar to ocean water. Now mind you, we do not um, give our patient ocean water. We give them hypertonic saline, which is slightly cleaner. They would then be encouraged to cough up the sputum. Okay, and then we can use the actual sputum to do various analysis. People could measure cytokines, chemokines, but what I'm going to concentrate on is inflammatory cells. Now we know uh, asthma, eosinophils are the major players. So the subsequent, uh, my subsequent talk is going to concentrate on inflammatory cells, uh, mainly eosinophils. Now the first question you may ask, why bother inducing sputum? Why not just get a spontaneous sample? Now children are not young adults. Many of them cannot expectorate as easily as uh, adults. But the technique of induced sputum is well tolerated in those as young as five years of age. Okay? And induced sputum has been proven to have better uh, quality cells, more viable cells, less contamination, allowing us to prepare better histology slides. And the actual technique is very reproducible. Now, it has been shown the cells in induced sputum has very, very good correlation with those present in bronchial alveolar lavage and also lung biopsy. So we've got a non-invasive way to look and study airway inflammation. Now, nowadays, airway inflammation is very topical. People are always talking about it. Why? Because we know airway inflammation, if uncontrolled, can lead to airway remodeling. Now, that's going to have long-term morbidity or even mortality. So how does it work? Uh, to be honest, nobody really knows. Okay? It has been proposed that hypertonic saline actually increases the airway lining fluid osmolality, and that's going to increase the vascular permeability, hence the mucus production. Hypertonic saline is a very, very strong cough stimulant. Okay? It also stimulates the mucociliary uh, movement helps to move the secretion from the more peripheral airways to the central airways. So the whole procedure actually helps to uh, bring out the sputum, bring out the phlegm and, and mucus. Now this is the unit at our hospital, not very impressive I'm afraid. Uh, we do have a uh, safety hood uh, whereby the actual induction is done. So anything, any aerosol that's generalized um, it's going to be suck out and filtered. We've got a small bench space here with where the simple initial processing of the sputum is done, but the actual staining and mixing with the chemicals 
is actually done in a proper laboratory. This picture shows my master's student demonstrating the technique. We have to monitor the spirometry on a regular basis. As we all know, hypertonic saline actually causes bronchospasm. Okay? We don't want that uh, uh, to happen. and We don't want the lung function to drop to, uh, um, to severely uh, and, and cause the patient uh, discomfort. As you can see, the actual nebulizer is within the hood. So as I've said, anything that's generalized is going to be sucked out. Um, without causing any contamination of the actual room. Now that's the protocol, very similar to the one initially described. We measured the baseline lung function, the FEV1. It has to be more than 60% predicted before we proceed. And we use 4.5 hypertonic saline. Now for more severe cases, we can use a low concentration, 3% or even normal saline. They would then inhale the solution in six cycles, as stated in the bottom, uh, each cycle has a different duration. After each cycle, the patient or the subject is encouraged to cough, to bring up the sputum. And after one minute of coughing and bringing up sputum, we repeat the lung function again to make sure the FEV1 is actually more than 80% of the baseline value. If that's not the case, we'd give the patient ventilin as a bronchodilator and um, monitor the response. Obviously, the actual procedure will stop once we've got adequate sample, or if the patient does not want to continue, or if the lung function drops by more than 20% uh, of the baseline. So safety, especially in children. As I've mentioned, if your patient has got severe asthma, brittle asthma, you could use a lower concentration hypertonic saline, like 3%. Uh, there's always a physician there when the procedure is being carried out. And pre-medication, some units would advocate the use of bronchodilator pre-treatment, i.e. give the patient bronchodilator beforehand, before the induction. One problem with that is that after giving the bronchodilator, the actual yield or successful sputum induction uh, uh, is less, the rate of success is less. Work done by Christiana Lex at the Brompton Hospital of looking at the actual technique, the feasibility and safety in difficult to control asthma. She managed to recruit 40 patients, now median age of 12.4 years, very severe asthma. Why do I say that? Because the inhaled corticosteroid dose is actually up to 2 milligram, very, very high dose for pediatric. Now, many of them are actually on second and third line prophylactic treatment, theophylline, Montelukas, long acting B agonists. And in fact, up to about half of them were taking oral corticosteroids. And if you were to look at the daily use of beta agonists, about 90% were using it on a daily basis, telling us they are still symptomatic despite on such a high dose of corticosteroids. So, we're dealing with a difficult control, you could say, maybe touching the brittle asthma group of patients. So, 38 and actually managed to um, undergo the sputum induction, and only 4 out of the 38 complain of moderate symptoms, tightness and wheeze, and those symptoms were reversed quite readily with the use of bronchodilator. 10 of them had minor symptoms, soft throat, nausea, and very transient. So from this data, we can say the procedure is relatively or quite safe in those with severe asthma, and the success rate was reported to be 75%. How about other people? Other people have actually reported success rate to be about 70 to even up to 100%. Now, our group at the Prince of Wales Hospital reported our experience too. I recruited 130 children of a median age of about 11 years old. They were of mild asthma or had mild asthma and they underwent the procedure of sputum induction and we were able to achieve a success rate of about 75%. Now three patients actually prematurely stopped the procedure, two because uh, they started vomiting and one, he didn't like the taste of the salty water and I thought he wasn't going to be a good swimmer. Anyway, um, minor symptoms, many of sore throat and chest discomfort, transient and um, um, as a whole, the procedure was well tolerated by children. So, if you decide to take up this 
uh, induction procedure at your hospital, I would give you some advice. Basically, you have to try it on yourself first, then you can uh, know what the feeling is like and you know how to explain to your patient. Send the parents away, okay? Don't keep the parents in the same room, otherwise the child will not do the nasty coughing and, and bringing up the sputum thing. Okay, or even bribe them, tell them, oh, I'm going to buy you an ice cream if you give me a proper sample. Now, the second part, I'm going to tell you something um, about my research. Um, the first part is going to be on cough. Now, we all know cough is very common. It's a very common symptom. In asthma, it's probably the, the prominent symptom, especially in asthma acute exacerbation. Cough can be the only symptom. But cough research is uh, difficult to carry out. Why? Because there's no objective marker of cough frequency. Now we know diary cards, parental reporting are extremely unreliable. And in the old days, people would advocate the use of a tape recorder to measure sort of how many times you've coughed. But we know the recorders are bulky and they only rely on a single signal, i.e. one audio signal whether it's because other people coughing or whether it's because somebody's talking, you would never know. At the Brompton, they've actually developed a cough monitor, very similar to the old days Walkman. Now, this is a, a very simple um, machine, actually. It, has got, it, it picks up two signals. One is the audio signal, so when somebody coughs, there's going to be a positive response as a noise. They also pick up a diaphragmatic or muscular uh, signal. So when somebody coughs, you need muscle contraction, at the same time there's a sound signal. So when you see two signals happening at the same time, you, um, you can quite readily say this is a genuine cough. And this machine has been validated to be uh, reliable, to be user-friendly, and we have published uh, using this machine in children. And it's very user-friendly. So I decided to measure cough frequency in asthmatic. But in a subgroup of mild intermittent, now if you know about asthma, there are four main groups, mild intermittent and then mild, moderate, severe, persistent. I decided to look at the mild intermittent because people have actually looked at the persistent group and there's no doubt there's an eosinophilic pathway driving the cough. And I also wanted to uh, assess the correlation between the underlying airway inflammation and the cough frequency. Our hypothesis was that it's not eosinophilic airway inflammation that's driving cough in this subgroup of asthma. We recruited 40 children, median age of 11.5, pretty normal lung function, predicted FEP1 of 83%, relatively asymptomatic if you were to look at their severity of asthma score and the daytime cough score. Now, we actually recruited a cough frequency over a 24-hour period, and our group had a median of 25.5. Another group actually monitored cough frequency in normal healthy children of similar age, and they reported in normal children, they also cough at a rate of about 11 <clears throat> episodes per 24 hours. So comparatively, our group had a higher and significantly uh, more cough compared to normal children. Now, this is the actual distribution of their cough frequency over a 24-hour period. As you can see here, when they go to bed at night, they do not tend to cough. Now, that is in contrast with the textbook classical teaching that nocturnal cough is prominent in asthmatics. They tend to cough in the morning. Now, this is not the case. I mean, we, we couldn't show that. So the coughs were mainly during the daytime. We then analyzed the correlation between cough frequency and the various um, lung function and airway inflammatory markers. Surprisingly, we were able to demonstrate a very strong correlation between spilt neutral fields and the cough frequency. The bottom curve is actually the scatter plot, showing you a very good correlation between the spilt neutral fields and the cough frequency. This work has been published in Thorax, and we are probably the first group to provide evidence that in mild intermittent asthma, there's increased cough, and this cough is not driven by eosinophilic airway type of pathway. It's actually dependent on neutrophilic inflammation. Now, this is the first step. Uh, we'll probably need another study to support our findings uh, to see whether reducing neutrophilic inflammation would actually reduce the cough frequency. The second study I want to share with you is to use is the use of airway inflammatory markers 
to um, help us, to guide us uh, whether or and when to reduce the dose of inhaled corticosteroids. Inhaled corticosteroids are very important as a prophylactic treatment in asthma, but we know unnecessary high dose can have complications. A paper published in BNJ about five years ago documenting patients on relatively high dose of fixotide presenting with hypoglycemia. And nowadays, in our clinical practice, we tend to use symptoms, lung function, and the use of ventilating as our marker to tell us when to come down with any corticosteroid or when to go up. But that may not be the right thing to do because we know symptoms, lung function, have very, very poor correlation with the underlying airway inflammation. Now, airway inflammation comes up again. That's a buzzword nowadays. We, and nowadays, we know symptoms are no good. And patients with severe asthma can have relatively normal lung function too. So we decided to study stable asthma, and by definition, they have not been using the ventilator for more than three times per week, and there's no need to change their inhaled corticosteroid dose. And we reduce that inhaled corticosteroid by half every eight weeks. Now, before the actual reduction, we measure the exhaled nitric oxide, we reduce them, and we measure the exhaled breath condensate. A failed induction was defined as patient became, becoming symptomatic, needing the use of beta agonists for more than five times per week. Now that's, the table shows you the baseline data. We had 40 children, 12 years of age, and relatively uh, a normal lung function too. Now that's the flow chart. So after visit one, uh, 10 exacerbated, so reducing the dose by half, 10 actually uh, could not tolerate that. One came off corticosteroids, at visit two, three exacerbated, stop reduction, basically the patient was actually symptomatic, so we thought clinically he should, we should not have uh, reduced the corticosteroids. So at the end of the four visits, 16 actually successfully came off the corticosteroids and 15 actually exacerbated. And uh, we were able to demonstrate that those who exacerbated has, had much higher exhaled nitric oxide and sputum eosinophils than those who did not exacerbate, who came off the steroids successfully. And using multiple logistic regression and controlling for various confounders, we were able to show sputum eosinophils and exhaled nitric oxide more than 22 parts per billion to be significant predictors for fair reduction. And looking at the various sensitivity and specificity, having eosinophils in your sputum would basically has got, would have a very, very perfect sensitivity to tell you that we are not going to be successful in reducing the inhaled corticosteroids. And this paper has been published in the Blue Journal, and basically we're the first group to show in pediatrics, the use of airway inflammatory monitoring is actually beneficial and good to guide you as to when you should come down your inhaled corticosteroids. Now this is hypothesis generating. And the next step to do is to do a proper RCT to see whether the use of um, this inflammatory marker is going to help you and uh, to be beneficial in actual patient care. Uh, this has been done, but in adults, published in The Lancet uh, by Ribbon Lester. So what they did, they approached 108 patients, 74 were randomized, one into the sputum control group, one into the BTS. BTS stands for British Thoracic Society Management Group. In the sputum group, uh, they didn't care about the symptom, they didn't care about the lung function, they only wanted to know the sputum. They wanted to maintain the sputum eosinophil to be less than 3%. If it's more than 3%, they would step up on the inhaled corticosteroid dose. If it's between 1 to 3, they would maintain the same dose. If it's less than 1, they would come down on the inhaled corticosteroid dosage. Whereas in the BTS group, uh, symptoms were important as well as lung function. So that's what we do nowadays. And they were um, able to follow the patients for 12 months. Now that's the baseline data. Basically, no significant differences between the two groups in terms of age, atopic status, lung function, baseline symptoms, and also airway inflammatory markers at baseline. Over 12 months, as expected, the induced sputum eosinophil was lower in the sputum management group. Likewise, for the exhaled nitric oxide, the symptoms and the use of beta agonists and lung function were similar at 12 months between the two groups. But what was striking was the asthma exacerbation. 
looking at a symptom group, much less severe exacerbation, i.e. they need to seek advice, even admit them to hospital. And that difference was actually already there after one month. So we have solid evidence to tell us monitoring airway is actually better. Monitoring the inflammation is the way to go. And they've actually done a post hoc analysis, and this monitoring method is actually cost effective too. So hopefully I've given you some evidence and information about sputum, sputum induction, and I think looking at airway inflammation is probably the way to go. But the technique has got limitations. It is very expensive. You need somebody dedicated to carry out the work. It's quite time consuming. For one patient, you need probably about 45 minutes for the actual induction process. For processing the sputum, you need another two hours. It is still a very much a hospital-based procedure, and it can be uncomfortable. They can have transient sore throat and chest discomfort. And comparing the three uh, non-invasive airway inflammatory markers, now nitric oxide is easy, uh, gives you the results straight away, pretty good repeatability, but it's, it has to be, say, it's very individualized. We are seeing data to tell us that severe asthmatic can have very, very low exhaled nitric oxide. Exhaled breath condensate is relatively quick, but problem with dilution and saliva contamination. The sputum process, I guess I'm biased, I think um, is a very good method to monitor airway inflammation. As I've said, it's expensive, it's time consuming. A uh, paper published last year looking at use of another marker in sputum. Less, cost, uh, less um, costly and um, can have the result um, within a short time period. Last but not least, I would like to thank various people and um, especially the group at Brompton, where I actually pick up the technique under the le leadership of Andrew Bush, and the various people, uh, the respiratory team at the Prince of Wales Hospital, and the very last people, my, my son. Um, even though I haven't been able to spend much time with him because of work commitments, he has always been very supportive. Looking at this and saying, oh, daddy, don't go yet. I'm going to give you a sample of mine for analysis. Thank you very much. Jenny高手個演講,咁就而家可以問題冇嘅,咁就大家可以用英文發問就得,廣東話發問就得,普通話都得。<笑><笑> 我教授用中文問我用中文答案你咁暫時係冇可能因為太貴同埋太需要長時間但係已經有人開始睇緊我哋除咗睇 希望你未有發現,我相信你今年五年會繼續新的發展,因為我覺得談的方面其實比好多資料我哋帶暫時的三個間的就是唔可以我哋平常的工作情況下用到。